maybe on your tables, you could just spend three minutes on this question. Is it the role of the teacher to shape students' moral views? If so, why? And if not, why not? Okay, could I draw your discussions to a halt? Oh, sorry, hands up. I've just learned this technique. Great, thank you all very much. Um, so could I invite any immediate responses from anybody in the room? What are your thoughts on that question? Somebody be brave. Yeah. If you let girls wear a sort of tomboyish clothes and they're younger, maybe they're more likely to become gay. And I, my response was, I didn't say you're wrong, <laughs> I didn't say you're wrong, but I, she knew by my response that I disagreed with what she was saying. And it, this is an adult, by the way, it was a, an adult class, but 
I was just saying that she very quickly wanted to show me that she she was open minded. So in the next debate, which was that we're all bisexual, or we we're all of the potential to be bisexual, I think was was the statement. And you could stand on the very uh, in agreement, very strongly in agreement, very strongly in disagreement. And she was the the most strongly in agreement in the next debate. So I I absolutely blocked her. There was no further. Dis she was embarrassed mm -hmm. uh, because of my response to her. Which wasn't right, and and that so I inhibited a conversation. I inhibited her view, and I made her feel ashamed, mm -hmm. and that's wrong, and it wasn't helping anything. Um, and who am I to 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 make her feel that way? So, but I I felt I was in the right at, at the time, and I was also conscious there was somebody in the class who was gay. So I was trying to be his voice, I think, but that was I was embarrassed by that afterwards, and so I think facilitating it's really hard in those kind of conversations, but it's really important. Otherwise, you you don't help. I don't know. Brilliant. Thank you. Anyone else? Anybody want to defend the view that maybe there is some shaping of children's moral views? Um, I was just saying that whether you do it deliberately or not, you're a role model for kids, and that kind of anything that you say may shape their, their morals. And kind of maybe uh, whether it's the children around them, the adults, the clubs, the school, their parents, everybody has that uh, uh, possibility of, of changing their morals. And you have to be quite aware, sorry, <coughs> quite aware of that kind of power that you have mm -hmm. when you're in the classroom as a teacher. Great, okay. Hi, at this table we felt there was a tension between um, your role as facilitator and sometimes uh, that you had a more stronger directing role. Um, we didn't like the verb, some of us didn't like the verb shape. We thought that perhaps it was stretch, um, like encourage people to be, we felt you were always encouraging people to be a little bit more open to revisit their assumptions. Mm -hmm. But sometimes we felt in a role as teachers that we had to say, well actually this is against what you're doing or how you're behaving, what you're saying is actually against the ethos of the school. So sometimes we felt we had to row in and take that role. And sometimes we felt comfortable with that, and sometimes that's very challenging. Great, thank you. One more view before we move on. Anybody else willing to share their thoughts on this question? Um, we were talking about as well just, just the idea of introducing critical thinking to children is shaping their moral education. If you don't introduce critical thinking, their moral education or you know, it remains the same. But when you intervene, and try and do critical thinking that's shaping and changing their moral education already yeah okay great thank you okay so lots of uh, my work has been um on precisely this question of um the d the, the terms i use are directive and non-directive teaching when we're when we're discussing moral or political or religious questions in the classroom should we always invariably be non-directive and by non-directive i mean should we never have the aim of persuading children that any view is right or wrong our aim should always simply be to open these questions up for discussion to facilitate exploration. Or should it sometimes be the case that we can have directive aims? Now to have directive aims is to teach in such a way that you hope to bring it about, albeit very subtly and gently, that children move towards a correct or correct view or away from an incorrect view. Um, that's assuming that it's possible to identify correct and incorrect views in any of these uh, areas. But if so, should we sometimes have that as our aim? And to have an aim of direction, to, to teach directively is not, of course, necessarily to teach didactically. It's not a question of standing up and preaching. It may rather be simply a question of steering the direction a discussion takes, being ready to intervene to ensure that where bad arguments are made, students come to see the problems with those arguments and where compelling arguments are made, um, they're not illegitimately shot down, that the, the strength of those arguments becomes manifest through the course of the discussion with a view to helping students see where certain views are very well supported by evidence and arguments or not at all supported by evidence and arguments. And in my opinion, there are some areas in the ethical domain where we should be directive. And so that's what I want to um, spend a bit of time arguing uh, today. Of course, there are also huge areas where we definitely shouldn't be directive. So I'm, I'm absolutely on board with the idea that vast swathes of the um, 
topics we're talking about in ethical education are genuinely open questions, questions to which no one knows the right answer. Um, and all we can legitimately do as educators is open those questions up and better enable young people to come to their own considered views on those questions. But I don't think all moral questions are quite like that. Some of them, at least, um, there are right and wrong answers, and it is part of our responsibility, or so I shall argue, to try and nudge students or persuade students in the right directions, in the direction of believing what's right and rejecting what's wrong. Anyway, let me proceed with the argument. Okay, so a quick overview of the talk. I shall first um, just describe what I take to be the phenomenon of reasonable moral disagreement, um, the fact that there is widespread agreement about moral questions, and it's reasonable. There's, there's, there's good grounds for disagreeing. The people, have, the people on each side of most of those arguments have, have um, at least some credible arguments on their side. Second, why reasonable moral disagreement is a problem for moral education. Third, some standard responses to that problem, standard but inadequate responses. And fourth, a proposed solution to the problem. Okay, so this is, this is actually the opening paragraph of the book. People disagree about morality. They disagree about what morality prohibits, permits, and requires. And they disagree about why morality pro prohibits, permits, and requires these things. Moreover, at least some of the disagreement on these matters is reasonable. It's not readily attributable to woolly thinking or ignorance or inattention to relevant considerations. Sensible and sincere people, armed with similar life experience and acquainted with roughly the same facts, come to notably different conclusions about the content and justification of morality. So if that's, if that's an accurate description of the whole of the moral domain, then all we can do as teachers is be non-directive, is open these questions up for discussion um, help students come to their own conclusions. There are, I think, two kinds of reasonable moral disagreement, one of which is uh, more problematic than the other. So the first is disagreement about the application of morality, and the second disagreement about the content and justification of morality. So I'll just say a little bit more about each of those two kinds of disagreements. So disagreements about application. This is the kind that I don't think we should be too worried about. So it doesn't matter too much if we disagree on exactly how to resolve particular moral questions or dilemmas or um, um, issues that come up. Even people who share a moral code um, may disagree on certain particular problematic cases. Um, so I, the example here might be cases where the truth hurts. Right? Suppose there's some secret in your family, some, some, some very um, shameful or embarrassing thing that's happened in your family. Someone asks, someone else outside the family asks you a question, and you then are confronted with a choice between either lying to them or revealing uh, uh, something in your, in your past or your family's past that's going to cause an awful lot of distress and upset. So there you have a little moral dilemma, and you can well imagine that people who are broadly speaking ethically on the same page. They all agree that we shouldn't cause needless distress, and they all agree that we should tell the truth, but they might disagree in this particular case. So one might say, well, you know, you ought to tell the truth about this and uh, accept that it's gonna cause some hurt, but it's better that the truth is out. Another person might say, no, it's, 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 there's no need. This is much better to tell a white lie in this situation. There's no need to cause the pain that would be caused by revealing this, this, this secret. So you can sort of imagine that there's gonna be disagreements like this in moral life all the time. That in itself, I don't think is a problem for moral education. So long as we all generally are on board with the idea that we shouldn't be deceiving people and nor should we be causing people needless distress, the fact that we might disagree about the application of those two principles in certain difficult cases isn't the end of the world. That, that doesn't mean that there's sort of a failure of moral agreement or moral consensus. It just means that some cases in life are really tricky. So cases like that are called cases of conflicting demands. There's also borderline cases, cases where we're not quite sure if a moral standard applies or not. So the example I have here is uh, cases of borrowing and forgetting to return. So I'm well aware that on my bookshelves in my office at the University of Birmingham, there are five or six books that I never purchased um, that were lent to me in the expectation that I would return them, and I never got around to returning them. And I now have no clear recollection of, of which, which of the borrowed books, who I borrowed them off. It would be very difficult, in fact, for me to, um, to, to, go, through, to go to the trouble of 
figuring that out and returning them to their rightful owners. We might disagree as to whether I'm here guilty of theft or not. Have I, have I stolen those books by failing to return them as I said I would? Or is this just part of the normal interchange of social life and I've, I've lost as many books as I've gained this way? It's really not a moral question at all. So we might disagree about whether the moral <coughs> prohibition on stealing applies to this particular case of borrowing and forgetting to return. So these kinds of disagreements, I think, shouldn't worry us too much. Of, of course, in the moment where you're wrestling with these dilemmas, it matters a great deal how you resolve them. But the fact that there's disagreements about how to resolve them doesn't imply that there's some sort of deep failure of moral agreement in society. It simply suggests that uh, our moral rules are such that certain tricky situations are going to be quite hard to resolve. So I'm not worried about disagreements about application. What is more worrying is disagreements about content and justification. So examples of disagreements about content, are we morally required to vote in general elections? Right, some people think the answer to that is yes. They think it's straightforwardly the case that in a democratic society, there is an obligation on all of us to, to participate in, in democratic elections. We are required to take our political obligations seriously. Others disagree and say, no, sure, in a democratic society, um, if you want to participate in an election, absolutely go ahead and do so. If you don't want to, that's fine as well. Right? We're a free society too, and it's, there's no obligation to vote. That's, that's down to you. So there's, a, there's a, a kind of basic disagreement here as to whether a moral requirement to vote is in force or is not in force, should or should not be in force. And similarly, obviously, is it morally wrong to eat meat? This is clearly a question that deeply divides Western society at the moment. Large numbers of people have deep and serious objections to the eating of meat, and uh, lots of other people don't. So there's no question that there are moral standards upon which we just disagree as to whether these are, these are standards at all. Are these standards we should or shouldn't be holding ourselves to? And that's much more troubling. If, it's, if we don't know which moral standards we should be trying to adhere to, then um, uh, our moral plight is more uh, uh, worrying than it may otherwise look. And secondly, disagreements about justification. Even in the cases where there is broad agreement on a particular standard, there might be deep disagreement about why the standard is in force. Um, so I, uh, I take the case of lying. So suppose there is general consensus that we ought to deal honestly with one another. We should not deliberately deceive one another um, in our dealings. But why is that? Um, and moral philosophers have come up with some radically different, very different looking answers to the, to the question of what might justify a prohibition on lying. So is lying wrong because it adds more pain than pleasure to the world? Because it fails to treat others as ends in themselves? Because the virtue of honesty is necessary for flourishing? Or because God forbids it? So they're all hopefully recognizable to you as um, answers that might be advanced by a utilitarian or a Kantian or a virtue ethicist or a Christian. And they look very different. It looks like the way in which people back up their moral standards is, is very different indeed. Now, these two kinds of disagreements are really problematic for moral education because if we see it at all as a part of our role as moral educators to be directive, to persuade children that these are standards that they should subscribe to, well, then we have to have some agreement, some way of settling the question of, well, which are these standards that we should be upholding and why? What argument are we going to offer? And since all of those four types of justification look <laughs> both radically different and controversial, um, that gives us quite a problem. It looks like, it looks like directive moral education is going to be a non-starter if this kind of disagreement um, is in force at the moment. Okay, so now to, to state what I see as the problem for moral education. The problem consists in the difficulty of reconciling three claims. Firstly, moral education aims to bring it about that children subscribe to moral standards and believe them to be justified. Second, there's reasonable disagreement about the content and justification of morality. And third, teaching propositions as true or standards as justified when there's reasonable disagreement about them is indoctrinatory, something we shouldn't do. 
So it can't be the case that all of those three claims are true, right? They, they're, these, they're, they're, mu they're, they're not mutually compatible. Like they can't all coexist. We have to let go of one of them, right? So it might be that we accept the first two, but just swallow our worries about indoctrination. So yeah, sure, okay, we can't, there is no um, objective or rationally defensible set of answers to these questions. So we'll just indoctrinate a set of answers, right? We'll just make children all good Christians um, by um, catechetical methods of teaching um, and not worry about the charge of indoctrination. That's one way we could jump. Another way we could jump is to reject the first claim. We could say it's just no part of our role as educators to attempt to persuade children to subscribe to moral standards or believe them to be justified. That's, that's not the job. And, it, and in some ways, I think the um, Educate Together Ethical Education curriculum puts brackets around that first claim. It says, okay, maybe it's not our role as educators to be attempting any of this. This, this directive moral educational task is not for us. Or we could try and challenge the second claim about the reasonableness of the disagreement about the content and justification of morality. Well, we've got to challenge one of them. We can't let them all stand because they're not compatible as they stand. Okay, so that's the problem that interests me. Let me just say a little bit more about indoctrination. To indoctrinate someone is to impart beliefs to her in such a way that she comes to hold them non-rationally or on some other basis than relevant evidence and argument. Propositions or standards about which there's reasonable disagreement are those for which the relevant evidence and argument is inconclusive. That's just what we mean by saying that there's reasonable disagreement about something. If a teacher wishes to persuade a learner that such propositions are true or such standards justified, she cannot do so by rational demonstration. She must instead resort to non-rational means of persuasion. So that's what I mean by indoctrination. I just mean that uh, you're indoctrinating if you're getting children to hold beliefs or to subscribe to standards without giving them good enough reasons for doing that, and you're using some other, some other non-rational means of persuasion. You're using your charisma, your authority as a teacher, your power over the children. Um, if you're using one of these sort of psychological mechanisms to get them to hold beliefs or subscribe to standards, then you're indoctrinating, then you're, then you're not teaching in a, in a rational, evidence-based, argument-based way. And I think we should try and avoid that, right? I think indoctrination is generally a bad thing, and we ought to find ways of morally educating children that don't require us to indoctrinate them. So, some standard responses. How might we try to tackle this problem? So, three ways in which we might do so. We could do without moral education. We could bite the indoctrination bullet, or we could just educate about morality. So doing without, perhaps we can sidestep the difficulty of teaching morality by supposing that morality is innate rather than acquired or caught rather than taught. If teaching morality is unnecessary, we need not look too hard for a defensible way of doing it. So this would be lovely. This would solve our problem. We wouldn't have to worry about the whole problem at all if we could just say, it's all right, children are innately and inherently moral. So all we have to do is just give them space to grow and flourish and they'll, and they'll grow up morally decent. The mor morality is just in them or they're developmentally morally good. Or perhaps that uh, morality is just caught from your society. If you're in a social group that's adhering to the moral standards, you'll just start adhering to them too. It's just socialization. And in both of those cases, it looks like the moral educator's off the hook. We don't have to worry anymore about teaching these moral standards because they're just there inherently or they'll just be picked up um, by osmosis. Well, I think we shouldn't um, hide behind either of these two options. On the innateness of morality, I'm perfectly comfortable with the idea that we're pro-social beings, right? Any sensible account of evolutionary development um, makes it clear that we are um, programmed, genetically programmed, to live in social groups, to be broadly sympathetic to one another's suffering, um, to, to want to cooperate with one another. We're, we're pro-social in that, in that biological sense. The trouble is that doesn't give us morality. That gives us some, um, some reason to suppose that we do have some inbuilt sympathy for one another, but it doesn't give us a set of uh, enforceable moral standards, standards that we hold ourselves to and we hold others to in a conscious way. So to have a moral code is to subscribe to standards of conduct 
that prohibit and require actions of certain kinds. And we're no more born subscribing to a moral code than we are born fluent in a mother tongue. So it may well be that Chomsky is right about language and we do all have an innate language acquisition device and that's what enables us to learn the language. But that doesn't mean that we're born speaking a language. And so something, something similar looks to be true of morality. It may be true that we're all born pro-social, but we still have to learn the moral code. We still have to learn the standards that govern conduct in our society. So I don't think we can hide behind innateness. And similarly, I don't think we should hide behind the idea that children might just catch morality without anybody teaching it to them. Adhering to moral norms requires children to resist powerful temptations. It seems doubtful that they would learn to resist these temptations without the incentives supplied by moral chastisement and training. So the thought here is that subscribing to a moral code isn't really like um, absorbing gender stereotypes. So we might suppose that the way in which lots of us learn how to behave like little boys or little girls is not taught, not deliberately taught by anybody. We just pick these up from the media and from the behavior of our parents and our peers, and we, we, we figure out and often figure out unhealthy and unhelpful things about how boys behave and how girls behave. Um, and this, is all, this all just happens sort of beneath the radar. But I don't think it's helpful to think about morality in those terms precisely because the function of morality seems to be to stop us doing things we really want to do, like lash out at somebody when they annoy us or take something we really want that isn't ours. Right? We, have to, we have to be instructed and taught not to do those things. Um, so it's not, uh, I suggest, plausible to suppose that um, the work morality does for us um, can be done just by socialization. We're going to ha actually have to engage in some moral teaching of some kind. Okay, what about the second solution? Um, biting the indoctrination bullet. Perhaps we should just accept that indoctrination is necessary in the moral sphere. Like we need people to be moral. It's unfortunate that we haven't got good enough reasons to offer them, but that's just tough. Uh, the, the important thing is that we get people behaving in a morally decent way, so we just indoctrinate those moral standards. I certainly think in the area of religious education, um, lots of people feel this way. Lots of people feel that, look, religion's not the sort of thing you can give a rational demonstration of, but the advantages or the, the, um, the importance of inducting children into religious traditions is so great for the people who belong to those religious traditions that we're entitled to indoctrinate them. We're entitled to override their rational reservations and uh, draw them in by whatever means necessary. So advocates of confessional religious education sometimes take the line that the value of having religious beliefs simply outweighs the disvalue of being indoctrinated. So the, the, um, the advocate of the confessional religious view can be worried about indoctrination. They can absolutely say, yes, indoctrination is bad. In an ideal world, you wouldn't have to do it. But we just do have to do it in this case because the importance of being saved is so great. So this is held to justify such means of imparting religious beliefs as catechism and evangelism, compulsory participation in prayer, worship, and liturgy, rewards for orthodoxy, and punishments for heresy. So these, they take it, are the sorts of mechanisms by which families and religious groups and religious schools induct children into religious belief. And they're, they're basically non-rational methods. It's not about giving children good reasons for these beliefs. It's about uh, manipulating their emotions in such a way that they come to hold those beliefs. So maybe we just have to do something like that in the case of morality. But those willing to bite the indoctrination bullet, I think, are guilty of two things. Firstly, I think they underestimate the harmfulness of indoctrination. They don't um, appreciate the damage we do to a person's um, flourishing, to their rationality, by indoctrinating them. When we indoctrinate, we bypass people's rational faculties and we saddle them with a set of beliefs that they hold in a way that's really hard for them to rationally interrogate or address. Right? This is the problem about religious and political indoctrination is that even, even really smart people seem their, their religious and political beliefs are somehow um, uh, isolated or cut off from uh, the rest of their rational thinking. So it's really hard for them to access those beliefs and rethink them and amend them or improve them or adjust them in light of their experience. 
And that's a significant disadvantage in life. That takes away a lot of your autonomy as a human being if you're not able to interrogate and revise your own beliefs in these important areas of life. But secondly, advocates of indoctrination also overestimate the stability of indoctrinated beliefs. So actually indoctrinating a belief doesn't guarantee that that person's going to keep holding it. Um, and we, we see this in the case of religious indoctrination all the time. We see people who have been raised in um, quite a rigid religious way just rejecting it wholesale. And again, that's not a rational rejection. It's not that they've rationally interrogated the beliefs and found them wanting. It's that they're kicking against, emotionally kicking against the, the, the burden that they feel has been sort of placed on them, the, that they feel overwhelmed by um, their religious uh, backgrounds. And so they reject them, they sort of uh, non-rationally or irrationally boot them all out. So we're not, it doesn't even guarantee, indoctrination doesn't even guarantee that they're going to keep holding those beliefs. All it does is guarantee that it's gonna make, you're going to make it really hard for a person to think intelligently or clearly or rationally about the beliefs they hold. So I think there are very good reasons for um, not biting the indoctrination bullet, for avoiding indoctrination if we possibly can. And then finally, maybe we just educate about morality, right? Maybe we, we give up the first um, of the three propositions that are incompatible um, and don't try and make children moral. So perhaps it's the job of moral educators to make children aware of a broad range of moral standards and putative justifications, to encourage them to subject those standards and justifications to critical scrutiny, and to invite them to form their own conclusions about which standards, if any, merit their subscription. So this seems a very, um, when dealing with controversial questions, this seems the, the right way to tackle it, right? If you have a controversial issue, yeah, this looks like what we need to do. We need to look at the different positions people hold, the different arguments that they have. We need to encourage them to think critically about those positions and arguments, and we need to give them the opportunity to form their own considered view. So maybe we could just do this with the whole of the moral sphere. But I think that's um, not sensible. It's not sensible because, firstly, it appears to uncomfortably extend the period of childhood amorality. It seems to allow the idea that children don't need to um, uh, adhere to any moral principle or standard at all until such time as they've had chance to think them all through and um, uh, look at the arguments for and against and uh, form their own considered views in their own time. And children can't do that at a young age, right? The only, you can only begin to think in that, in that intelligent, critical way about controversial questions and form considered views when you've reached a certain stage of intellectual development, when you reach a certain uh, level of rationality and competence. But we don't actually, in practice, allow our children to go around thumping each other or taking each other's things or lying to their parents or their teachers at will because they haven't yet had chance to think through um, what the case might be for and against those things. So it would be an odd policy, it would be an odd child-raising policy um, to, to try and kind of treat all of morality as controversial. And secondly, it does seem to give children the option of remaining morally agnostic. Um, so if we think about the standard complaint about non-confessional religious education, it's that, well, surely the natural outcome of non-confessional religious education is that everyone will just not be religious, right? They'll, they'll look at this smorgasbord of religious options, which is completely bewildering to the outsider, and just say, well, you know, I, I have no way of choosing intelligently between this, this raft of peculiar-looking views, so I'll just opt out, I'll just be agnostic. Well, it seems that there's a, there's a real danger if we treat morality in the same sort of way. If we take this sort of non-confessional approach to morality, look, here's all the ethical theories, here's all the moral standards that different people adhere to and the different reasons why they adhere to them, over to you. That looks bewildering, right? That looks like, how am I ever going to find my place in this moral scheme. And maybe the, the thing to do is just to throw up my hands in despair, just say, well, I don't know. I have no idea what to think, right? Let, let every person live their own way. I'm agnostic about it all. That, that seems like a reasonable response and a likely response if we're consistently non-confessional about morality and ethics. So I don't think we should do that either. 
Okay, so the plight of the moral educator. This is where I think we find ourselves. And by moral educators, I mean both parents and teachers, right? I'm, I'm talking to, to, to both the parent and the teacher about the children in their care. So few parents or teachers are dogmatically committed to the idea that morality is innate rather than acquired, or caught rather than taught, or to the non-rational inculcation of moral standards, or to educating only about morality. Rather, seeing no other alternative, most shift uneasily back and forth between these options, resting with each just long enough to be reminded of its deficiencies. This is not a criticism of those responsible for the moral education of children, but a description of their plight. Neither parents nor teachers have a clear sense of what they're supposed to be doing in this area. Let me just pause there before we go on to uh, the solution that I want to defend. Can I invite any thoughts or reactions on what I've said so far on this account of the plight we're in as moral educators and why it's problematic for us? Anybody think I've horribly mischaracterized things? Yes. Hi, it's just a thought really, but as you were talking about indoctrination yeah. on the one hand, and then you gave the example of cultural norms being communicated, mm. you know, you gave the example of gender norms or whatever. Yeah. Is that not the same thing? Are we not indoctrinating as a society people into certain ways through the communication of cultural norms of different kinds? Uh, it's a question, I suppose. Yep. Is yeah, that yeah. different? Great question. So um, the, the only way in which it's different is that I take the socialization version to be not intentional. So um, I take it that uh, most of the time we're not trying to get our little boys and little girls to internalize these norms about how boys behave and how girls behave. In fact, lots of us progressive types would like to actively challenge those norms. So the socialization happens despite us or, or against our will or without our deliberate collusion. But it is non-rational. It's, it's absolutely non-rational. It, it merely um, lets us off the hook uh, for um, the intentional blameworthiness, right? We're not deliberately doing it. But yes, it's not great. I'm not an advocate at all of uh, <laughs> the socialization of unhelpful gender norms. It's just that that's how I think gender norms are acquired. And it could be how moral norms are acquired. But and, um, and is that not the natural extension of that, is that you know, morality can be similarly well, ex normed into children. It can be, that's right, except that I think because morality is often pushing against powerful impulses, if it was just a sort of background, unenforced uh, uh, norm or like etiquette or something, like putting your elbows on the table, right? if you had a strong desire for that went the other way from this norm, right? Uh, an etiquette norm's not gonna stop you doing it. right? If you, that's why morality ha is requires a bit more force. That's why I talked about moral chastisement and training. It requires you to be told off or punished or there to be some negative consequence for you of stealing somebody's thing or lying to them or hurting them uh, because there just being a sort of politeness norm against it is unlikely to stop you. It's unlikely to lead to the internalization of the moral norm in a way that we think of as being governed by morality as being much more uh, a much more serious affair than etiquette. But yeah, th in lots of ways they're similar, of course. Any other thoughts or reactions at this point? Hi, so just a quick, simple story, really dealing with six-year-olds, but something that I realized a few years ago, I came across a boy and a girl sitting next to each other. She was crying. I went over and she told me there's a color coloring pencil this guy has. He won't share it with me. So I looked at him and I said, uh, you know, sharing is caring. And he looked straight back at me and he said, yeah, but I don't care. <laughs> so, you know, I realized there and then morally he knows the right thing to do is share, but he's decided I'm not going to share. And I couldn't argue with that. In fact, I kind of respected his stance. I said, well, I can't force you to share because that would be wrong. So, do you know, just open my eyes to morals and he is a lovely kid. So yeah. at, a, at a young age, he, yeah. <laughs> he knew where he stood, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe not consistently lovely, but <laughs> often lovely. Any others? Was I think there was a point over here? Did you want to say something? I 
I suppose just another um, on the ground response. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't be quite so, I, I think I'm very much on the pro-social mm -hmm. idea of students, that mm -hmm. they are innately um, good and that were they working in a blank space, just the, the, the living out of moral action like that one will bring them to their own conclusions. So eventually that boy will realize that I don't care until I'm isolated within this classroom space and now maybe my action has taught me to sharing might be better option for me rather than that being taught to me. Um, so I guess then just when it says on the board, uh, on the PowerPoint, few teachers are dogmatically committed to the idea of <coughs> innate moral prosociality. I think I would be more committed to that idea and to the very committed to the idea of um, educating about morality. Mm -hmm. um, and the only reason I'm committed to that idea of educating about morality is because of the ca systemic problem with capitalism. And, and I think maybe, I only say this because I think many of us in the room are in that same space that we feel that the system has been so flawed as that capitalism has expanded exponentially, <laughs> exponentially and we're working with insecure students. And just to say, I mean, in an ideal world, I would hope that we are on an arc of progress where we move towards perhaps a, a better system. I mean, we're a tiny dot in the spectrum of humanity, a post-capitalist or a post-extreme capitalist system where we don't need moral education anymore. It's just helping students to write the system. And when that system is righted, I, I would think that moral education hopefully will go out the window and people will learn their morals through um, action rather than education. It's just a perspective of a teacher. Fantastic, thank you. Um, that's really interesting. So the, the, yeah, you're, you're vastly more optimistic about the human condition than I am. Um, I, I should reiterate, of course, that I agree that we are um, biologically pro-social in all sorts of interesting and useful ways. So I'm not, I'm not at all against that idea. I also think we are biologically pretty shitty to each other quite often. That there's also quite violent impulses and quite um, territorial impulses. Um, I think there's lots of things we've evolved that are tremendously helpful to morality and lots of things we've evolved that aren't terribly helpful to morality. Um, but I suppose the most fundamental point I want to make is that morality is a bit more than just a pro-social impulse, right? Morality in, it requires us to hold ourselves and one another to certain standards of conduct. And, and those standards uh, ought to be communicable and uh, justifiable to one another. If we're going to hold each other to these standards, we ought to be able to say what they are and explain why um, we're going to punish people for stealing other people's things and why we're going to make people feel bad if they lie to us or um, uh, cheat in tests or whatever it is, that whatever the moral standards are, they ought to be clearly articulable, um, teachable and rationally defensible. Um, and that's, that's a, a layer of culture on top of just our kind of natural pro-social impulse. So morality for me is, is more than this, this pro-social impulse. So I don't want to deny that, just I don't want to say that that's ever going to be enough to give us morality in the sense that I'm understanding it here. But thank you, that's really helpful. Okay, so let me go on and talk a bit about the solution that I want to defend. So notwithstanding reasonable disagreement about the content and justification of morality, I think there is a core set of robustly justified moral standards to which everyone should subscribe. Moral educators need not resort to indoctrination to bring it about that children subscribe to these standards and believe them to be justified. Right, the reason we don't have to resort to indoctrination is because the standards, there is a compelling rational justification for the standards in question. And if that's right, then we can teach the compelling rational justification and we're offering children reasons for the moral um, beliefs or commitments that we are um, seeking to persuade them of, not simply indoctrinate them by some manipulative or catechetical method. Okay, so um, in order to defend this view, I just want to go back to the beginning a bit about what's in, what a standard is and what subscribing to a standard looks like and what it means to hold beliefs about a standard being justified looks like. So firstly, subscription to standards. One of the things human beings do is hold themselves and sometimes each other to standards of conduct. In some cases, adoption of a standard is a deliberate and datable event, and adherence to it requires continual motivational effort. 
So an example here would be New Year's resolutions. Suppose I make a New Year's resolution to exercise three times a week, right? I can pinpoint the moment at which I started subscribing to that standard. It was the 1st of January, 2019. And, and I can hold it in my mind as something I'm always trying to hold myself to. Every week I remind myself I must exercise three times this week. That's what I've committed myself to. So sometimes subscribing to a standard looks like that. It's, it's, uh, it's a goal you've set yourself and you're continually reminding yourself to adhere to. But in other cases, adoption is a gradual and subconscious process and subsequent adherence comes quite naturally. And here we might think of rules of subject-verb agreement in your native language. So none of us have to think too hard about how to construct sentences in our native language in which the subject agrees with the verb. Right? That's just naturally how we communicate. That's how we've learned to communicate, how we've always communicated. But we're still following a rule. We're, following, we're subscribing to and following linguistic standards, and that's what enables communication between people. So standards come in many, many shapes and sizes, many different varieties. Sometimes we have to think quite hard about holding ourselves to them. Sometimes it comes very naturally and, and, and below the level of conscious thought to hold ourselves to them. But in all cases, we're, we're rule following or um, holding ourselves to the standards in question. Subscription to a standard is what David Kopp calls a syndrome of attitudes and dispositions. It's conative, affective, and behavioral. So conative um, has to do with your intentions or what you're trying to do. Affective has to do with your feelings, how you feel about what you do, and behavioral has to do with your behavior. So a person who subscribes to a standard normally intends to comply with it, feels good about complying with it and bad about failing to comply with it, and habitually does comply with it. So when I talk about subscription to a standard, I mean this cluster of attitudes and um, dispositions. I don't mean a belief, and that's, this is the, the reason for going into this is because I think it's pretty unhelpful to talk about moral beliefs a lot of the time, as if these are sort of cognitive achievements like beliefs about who the prime minister is or something like that. To hold yourself to a standard, to, to subscribe to a standard, is to try to conform your co conduct in a certain way, to try to um, uh, behave in accordance with some principle, to feel good about yourself when you do it and bad about yourself when you fail to do it and to normally uh, behave in that way. That's what subscribing to a standard means and it's very unlike holding true beliefs. So moral beliefs, I'm not saying there aren't ways in which we can usefully speak about moral beliefs but a lot of the time I think what matters in morality is standard subscription, not beliefs. Okay, so most of the standards we subscribe to are not moral ones. So again, at the moment, I'm talking much more broadly about standards in general. Many, many standards are not moral standards. For example, pour the milk before the tea. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Exercise for 30 minutes three times a week. Drive on the left. Proportion your beliefs to the evidence and don't split infinitives. So this is, these are a, a whole variety of types of standard that we uh, may or may not adhere to. Some of you will accept some of these and not others. None of you, incidentally, should accept the standard don't split infinitives. That's a bad rule for which there is no good justification. Um, but they come in all kinds of shapes and sizes, and lots of them aren't moral, and I, and I think none of these are moral. Right? So uh, not, not a single one of those is, is ordinarily a moral standard that we hold ourselves to. Now, they might be turned into moral standards, so sometimes religious standards um, about loving the Lord your God is sort of inflated into a moral standard by religious people, or the epistemic one, proportion your beliefs to the evidence. You might think that there's an ethics of belief, that not only is that, is that good epistemic practice, but actually we're sort of morally required to proportion our beliefs to the evidence. So you might turn an epistemic standard into a moral standard by giving it the, the weight and the gravitas that comes with morality. But ordinarily, I suggest these standards are not moral ones. It always makes sense to ask of a standard to which one subscribes or to which one is thinking about subscribing, whether subscription is justified. That's always a reasonable question to ask. We often don't ask it, right? People who always pour the milk before the tea may never ask why they do that. And it may not matter. It's not very important whether you put the tea first or the milk first. Maybe you think it is important, <laughs> but but whether you think it's important or not, um, th it's clear lots of people never actually get round to asking for the justification for the standards. 
right? But in the case of moral standards, I will suggest it's really important that we do ask about the justification for them. Um, and it's always possible, it always makes sense to say, okay, but why is there that rule? Why should I hold myself to this standards? Okay, so then on to moral standards specifically. So a standard is moral, I suggest, when a person's subscription to it has the cognitive, affective, and behavioral features of all standard subscription, but also it's universally enlisting and penalty endorsing. So a moral standard is one with which a person not only intends and inclines to comply, but also desires and expects everyone else to comply too. This is a really important distinguishing feature of moral standards on the view of morality that I'm wanting to defend here. That what makes a standard moral is that it not only one that you try to hold yourself to, like a New Year's resolution, but one that you think it's really important everyone holds themselves to. Right? It matters not only that I don't go around stealing, but that no everybody goes around not stealing. Right? That it's it's really important for the for the standard to even make sense that everyone subscribes. Right? If only I don't steal, right, then I'm a mug because everyone else is going to steal my things and I'll never steal theirs, so I'll end up with nothing. So the distinguishing feature of a moral standard, one of the distinguishing features is that they're universally enlisting. You want everyone else on board with this standard too. And where you meet people who don't subscribe to a moral prohibition on stealing, you see it as part of your role as a moral agent to try and co-opt them, to try and persuade them, to make them feel bad about their thefts. So that's one feature. And secondly, and relatedly, a moral standard is one whose violation a person sees as warranting punishment or censure. So it matters so much when we fail to comply with moral standards that we ought to favor punishment or censure, some kind of blame or condemnation, um, and, and for ourselves too. So we should think of ourselves as, as deserving punishment or blame if we fail to adhere to our moral standards. And we should stand ready to see others punished or censured or blamed or condemned for their failures. Now, lots of people don't like this, right? It's not, it's not very attractive, blame and condemnation and punishment. These aren't nice things to do to one another. But the point about a moral code is that it really matters that we all hold to it, right? That's, that's what morality is, as distinct from mere etiquette or um, uh, prudence. Or, 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 or There are many, many kinds of rules that we may or may not follow. Culinary rules about how to make the best lasagna. It doesn't matter whether anyone else subscribes to those rules, right? Everyone else is free to make lasagna how they please. But the distinguishing feature of morality is it matters that we all hold ourselves, we all hold ourselves to these standards, and that there are consequences for failing to do so. So that's what I take a moral standard to be. And if that's right, then it really matters that we've got good justifications for our moral standards, because we're not only saying, I'm committing myself to behaving in this way, but we're saying I'm committed to enforcing this way of behaving on everyone else in the world, right? Where, where, where I encounter people willfully stealing each other's things or clubbing each other over their heads, I'm going to stand up and say that's wrong. I'm going to stand up and say that person ought to be restrained or punished or prevented from doing what they're doing. That's what morality is. It's, it's universally enlisting and penalty endorsing. So John Stuart Mill... Um, uh, is one of, the, um, one of the philosophers who is clear about this penalty-endorsing aspect, this, this punishability aspect of morality. He writes, For the truth is that the idea of penal sanction, which is the essence of law, enters not only into the conception of justice, but into that of any kind of wrong. He means moral wrong here. We do not call anything wrong unless we mean to imply that a person ought to be punished in some way or other for doing it. If not by law, by the opinion of his fellow creatures. If not by opinion, by the reproaches of his own conscience. This seems the real turning point of the distinction between morality and simple expediency. And as with non-moral standards, it always makes sense to ask of a moral standard whether subscription to it is justified. So we should never be subscribing to moral standards precisely because of their universally enlisting and penalty-endorsing character. It's never enough to say, oh, well, it's just this is what I think. You know, I just, that, that's what my mum and dad did. So that's why, that's why I think this way. Right? That's not a good enough reason. If you subscribe to a standard in a way that stands ready to see other people punished for not complying with it, then you need to have a really good justification for it. So the justification of morality really matters.
Okay, I then want to draw a distinction between two kinds of moral education, which I want to call moral formation and moral inquiry. By moral formation, I mean the attempt to bring it about that children subscribe to moral standards. So subscription is, as I said, cognitive, affective, and behavioral. It's to do with your attitudes and dispositions. And if you are engaged in a practice of moral formation, you're trying to shape children's attitudes and dispositions. You're trying to make them want to behave in certain ways, uh, feel bad for failing to behave in those ways, and to be in the habit of behaving in those ways. Moral inquiry is the more is the kind of the cognitive correlate of all of that. So moral inquiry is, well, what justifies these standards? Why should people hold themselves to standards in this way? So it's the exploration with children of questions about the justification of moral standards. So first of all, moral formation. Moral formation is a matter of shaping children's dispositions and attitudes. How do we do that? The methods, I think, will be immediately recognisable and familiar to all of us. We issue prescriptions. Don't hurt your sister. Don't lie to me. Um, don't, don't steal from that shop. We reward compliance. Right? We, we praise children when they behave well, and we punish them. And then punishing non-compliance, we punish them when they behave badly. So it's a very familiar part of both, I would say, both parenting and schooling, that children are rewarded for conducting themselves honestly, generously, um, non-violently, um, in, in appropriate ways, and they're punished for the opposites, for, for being cruel or hurtful or dishonest or violent. We model compliance. Somebody mentioned modeling earlier. An important form of moral formation is the behaviors that we model as teachers. So um, part of moral formation is behaving, is, con is constraining our own behavior by moral standards, by, by acting in a way that is, is within the bounds of moral decency um, and modeling that behavior for children. And then finally, we model reactions to the compliance and non-compliance of others. So we express dismay when we hear on the news of some, some case of political corruption. Right? We, we model our horror at the ways in which certain politicians behave for our children to see so that they um, see how we should react to uh, corrupt or violent or oppressive behavior on the part of others. So those are the methods of moral formation. I think they should be very familiar to all of us. There may be more. That's just a sort of indicative list of the ways in which we attempt to shape children's attitudes and dispositions. Moral formation is principally cognitive, affective, and behavioral. It focuses on children's intentions, feelings, and habits. But it does have a cognitive element because compliance with moral standards involves certain kinds of judgment and inference. So children must be able to judge that an action belongs to a morally regulated class and infer that it's required or prohibited. So what I mean by that by saying, what I mean by that is that um, if we're teaching us a, a prohibition on stealing, then not only will we model not stealing and reactions to theft and punish children if they do steal things, but we also have to teach them how to know what stealing is. We have to teach them to be able to identify that some things in the world are the property of other people. That's a kind of cognitive judgment about who owns what and what acts of appropriation are acts of theft. Right? So there are, there's a cognitive element, of course, to just learning to hold ourselves to moral standards, but it's a, it's a low-level cognitive element. It's just figuring out, well, which are cases of this? Which are the cases that are the things that we must or mustn't do? It's not the, 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 the heavy cognitive work of justifying these standards, which belongs into the category of what I'm calling moral inquiry. So moral formation does not involve imparting beliefs about the justification of moral standards. Okay, so moral inquiry, this is the cognitive bit. This is, this is the bit where we have to, are obliged to um, teach children. If we're, if we're going to attempt to induct children into these moral standards, to make them subscribe to, uh, to, to, to bring them up in a way that um, they come to subscribe to moral standards, we owe them a justification for that. We have to explain to them and justify why we're doing that. So moral inquiry is a matter of exploring with children whether, why, and when subscription to moral standards is justified. Where the educator aims to persuade children that moral standards are or are not justified, moral inquiry is directive. And where the educator does not aim to persuade, an exploration of justificatory arguments is simply open-ended, then moral inquiry is non-directive. So that's the distinction I introduced right at the beginning of the talk between directive and non-directive um, teaching. 
and in the moral domain between directive and non-directive moral inquiry. That didn't sound good, did it? The question then is whether there is a set of moral standards such that it is appropriate for educators to bring it about that children subscribe to them, moral formation, and to bring it about that children believe them to be justified. That is, to attempt to directively persuade children that these are standards they should subscribe to, they should hold themselves and everyone else to. Okay, so I think there is, and I'm, I, I'm going to call it, following... Um, David Kopp, the problem of sociality justification. I think there is a decisive justificatory argument for subscription to some basic moral standards. The argument rests on two claims. First, that all human beings, or at least all human beings living alongside others in social groups, are unavoidably confronted by a serious practical problem, which we can call the problem of sociality. And second, that human beings can effectively ameliorate this problem, make it better, by subscribing to some basic standards of conduct. That's the structure of the, the argument, that there's a problem here that we just can't avoid. Right? Any human being who isn't a hermit, any human being who's living in a social group, is going to encounter this problem. And the only way to tackle the problem is to hold ourselves and each other to certain standards of conduct. So, the, the circumstances of justice. The problem of sociality arises because of three contingent but permanent features of the human condition, sometimes called the circumstances of justice. Accounts of these differ slightly among philosophers, but they, are, they have a very uh, long and distinguished history in Western philosophy of, of, people, of people drawing attention to these standards, or these uh, circumstances, sorry. Um, and this, these, I think, are the core three. Rough equality limited sympathy, and moderate scarcity of resources. And discussions of these circumstances can be found in the writings of many philosophers, including Thomas Hobbes, David Hume, H.L.A. Hart, G.J. Warnock, John Rawls, J.L. Mackey, and others. So what are these three circumstances? Rough equality. Because we're roughly equal in strength and intelligence, we each know that we have a reasonable chance of coming out on top in any physical or strategic conflict, and we're each aware that those around us know the same thing about their chances. So what I mean by rough equality, of course we differ enormously in physical strength and in intelligence, in, in, a, in a whole variety of attributes, right? Human beings are tremendously variable. But we also, either on our own or in, in, uh, in groups, um, pose some kind of credible sympathy. Our sympathy for strangers is limited. Now I hope, I'm sure lots of people in this room are very optimistic about our capacity to have universal beneficence, to care about all human beings. I hope you all do. I hope you all try to. I try to. But we're never going to achieve that to the degree that would be required to eliminate conflict and breakdowns in cooperation in society because our sympathy is always going to be um, unevenly distributed at best. However much we try to love and care for distant others, we will never, just psychologically, we're never going to be able to put their needs, give their needs the same importance in our considerations as the needs of ourselves and our loved ones or our children or the people in our immediate circle. So our sympathy is limited in the sense that we do not have equal and boundless sympathy for every other human being. Rather, we have a great deal of sympathy for a small group of human beings and only a little sympathy, if any, for those we don't know or for distant others. So our sympathy for strangers is limited in the sense of being notably weaker than self-love and familial love. We are inclined to prioritize the safety and satisfaction of ourselves and our loved ones over the safety and satisfaction of others. And finally, um, scarcity of resources. Because resources are not abundant enough to satisfy everyone's needs and wants, we are forced into competition with each other for access to goods in short supply. So it will always be the case that there will never be quite enough of the nicest things to go round so that everybody can have the same in any straightforward way. So there will always be competition for resources, competition for the nice things in life. 
And these I want to suggest are basic features of the human condition. It's just how we are. The, the kinds of creatures that we are situated in, the kind of world we're situated in, is such that we will always be, we will always have these features of rough equality, limited sympathy, and moderate scarcity of resources, which together are, are always going to be a recipe for trouble. Right? It will always be the case that um, because we each know that um, we're vulnerable to attack by one another, because we're in competition for resources and because we are more sympathetic to some people than others, there's always going to be a danger of cooperation breaking down or conflict breaking. Evolution of ego. I know I'm getting a bit mad here, but like, yep. if you, no, but r sincerely, if you brought people to a state yep. where they truly could meditate to the extent that they could see, I am at one with other people, with yep. the universe, I'm no better than nobody, nobody's better than me, that we would move away from that model and we wouldn't need to be have standards because we truly would realize that other people are the same as us and yep. in that case would behave. Brilliant. We would still need history, we'd still need that, that would be just. No, it's a great question and I want to reassure you that all of the philosophers who talk about this absolutely agree with you that if we were angelic, if we were, if we were what they, call angelic beings, we wouldn't need morality at all, right? There would be no need for moral standards because we would just be always beneficently, altruistically disposed towards one another. And if we ever evolve to a point where we are the kinds of beings that you're envisaging, where we are genuinely, um, universally compassionate, I'm afraid I don't personally think we're ever going to get there. But I absolutely... <laughs> but, but in a... But in a <laughs> But in a way, I want to agree with you that if we did, right, if, I'm, if, I, if my pessimism is wrong and we ever did get to that point where we were m all meditating and all genuinely equally compassionate to all living beings, then I don't think we'd need morality anymore. We wouldn't need rules holding us to standards of conduct and we wouldn't need to punish people for falling short of those standards because it would never happen. So, yeah, so I, I, kind of, I kind of agree that if the world were like you want it to be, we wouldn't need morality. I just don't think... I don't think we're ever going to be like that, but, but I certainly don't think we're like that now. Yeah, Maybe we can agree on that. Okay. Okay, the clear implication of these circumstances taken together is that there is in human social groups a standing propensity to outbreaks of conflict and breakdowns in cooperation. So here's how Hobbes puts it. Hobbes has some marvellous descriptions of human life being nasty, brutish, and short. From this equality of labour ariseth Sorry, from this equality of ability ariseth equality of hope in the attaining of our ends. And therefore, if any two men desire the same thing, which nevertheless they cannot both enjoy, they become enemies. And in the way to their end, which is principally their own conservation and sometimes their delectation only, endeavor to destroy or subdue one another. Now, Hobbes is particularly pessimistic about um, the, the ease with which we slide into... Uh, a state of, of, of war against all, continual warfare. He thinks it's really easy for us to be constantly locked in struggle and conflict with one another. Now, maybe we don't have to be as pessimistic as Hobbes, but we should all be attuned to the continual threat to our cooperative schemes, to peace of these tendencies in the human condition. Okay, ameliorating the problem. The problem of sociality is ameliorated when members of social groups subscribe to cooperation-sustaining and conflict-averting standards of conduct. So morality is a system of a particular sort of constraints on conduct, one whose central task is to protect the interests of persons other than the agent and which present themselves to an agent as checks on his natural inclinations or spontaneous tendencies to act. We need morality because... Our impulses will sometimes lead us into conflict, will lead us to um, get mad at people, get irritated with them, not want to cooperate with them anymore. Um, and we need some a structure of, of, of rules in place that says, okay, look, I know you're annoyed, but you've signed up to this cooperative endeavor, right? You've committed yourself to this. You've signed a contract or you've, you've uh, promised you'll engage in this activity, and now you're obligated to keep to that obligation, right? now tautologically. Now, now you must keep to that obligation. Um, so we have to have uh, a structure of standards or rules of conduct which um, constrain our impulses, which stop us from simply lashing out or taking what we want or uh, walking away when things get hard. 
That's a requirement of um, keeping social groups working. There is then a straightforward and robust justification for subscription to a set of basic moral standards. Now, these are very basic. I'm not suggesting that um, we should be holding ourselves to very high standards of ethical behavior. The standards justified by this argument include prohibitions on killing and causing harm, stealing and extorting, lying and cheating, and requirements to treat others fairly, keep one's promises, and help those in need. These are standards to which everyone has reason to subscribe and to which almost everyone does in fact subscribe. Now, when I say almost everyone does in fact subscribe, firstly, I don't mean that we don't all fail sometimes to hold ourselves to these basic standards of conduct. And secondly, I accept that there are always a few benighted souls who we simply cannot reach, or who, wh however hard we try, we cannot get them on board with the social contract, with, with morality, with the, 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 the basic obligations that bind us in a social group. But they're very familiar and they're very widely taught in homes and schools, I would suggest. And they're justified. And they're justified because of the threats to all of our safety and social stability posed by the circumstances of justice or um, the problem of sociality. And that uh, justification for holding ourselves and each other to basic moral standards holds independently of whether one happens to be... Um, Kantian or utilitarian or Aristotelian or Christian, right? Th whatever other moral commitments or whether one subscribes to or doesn't subscribe to, some grand ethical theory or unifying accounts of life and what it means to live well, it will always be the case that just by the nature of being human beings living in social groups, we need these basic rules and we need them to be taught, right? We need each generation to pass them on to the next generation and we need them to be enforced, right? There needs to be punishment or condemnation or censure when we fail to hold ourselves to these basic requirements and prohibitions. The basic moral standards whose currency in society ameliorates the problem of sociality can legitimately be taught by means of both moral formation and directive moral inquiry. So we ought both to teach these standards in schools in the sense of requiring children to tell the truth and not hurt each other and um, keep their promises, and also offer the justification in directive in discussion, in, in, in moral inquiry, when it comes to talking about the moral standards and why people behave in certain moral ways or hold themselves to certain standards, we ought to be saying, look, there are at least some moral standards that we all ought to be holding ourselves to. They're robustly justified and we need them. Um, as a condition of, of, of everybody's safety and security, as a, as a condition of not being vulnerable to the, the continual state of war that Hobbes talks about. That is, moral educators can aim to bring it about that children subscribe to them and believe them to be justified. Okay, so the talk was called Rational Moral Education. If we're serious about morally educating children rationally, then I think we're going to need to think hard about the whole moral realm, and we're going to have to divide it into three basic categories. There are three basic types of moral standards. There are moral standards like the ones I've just talked about that are robustly justified, and that it is our job to persuade children of the justification for. Again, I'm not suggesting we do this by preaching. I, we're, don't do it how I'm doing it with you now. Don't stand at the lectern and tell them they're justified. That's not the way to do it. It's absolutely going to be a question of um, discussion and helping them to see with reference to their own experience and their own lives and the challenges they face in their own social groups, helping them to see why human social interaction is always vulnerable to break down in, the, in these ways and why morality is the solution to that problem. But there'll be justified moral standards, There'll be controversial moral standards, and lots of moral standards will be in this category, including the ones about whether we should be vegetarian and whether we should vote in general elections. These are controversial standards and should be taught as such. So when we, when we put things in this category, it's not our job to be persuading children of anything. It's our job to be opening the questions up for discussion. But then finally, there's a third category that I haven't really talked about, which is demonstrably unjustified moral standards. So some of the things people in our society morally hold themselves to are simply lacking any kind of credible justification or argument, argumentative support. 
And in those cases, again, I think we should be teaching persuasively. We should be discouraging allegiance to demonstrably unjustified moral standards. So we need to break the moral realm down into these three categories and teach standards accordingly. So commitment to justified moral standards is encouraged by means of moral formation and directed moral inquiry. Arguments for and against controversial moral standards are explored through non-directive moral inquiry. And allegiance to unjustified moral standards is discouraged by means of directive moral inquiry. Okay, I do have a little discussion thing to go on to in a moment, but let me just pause and invite comments or questions on what I've said first. Hi, um, I just wanted to say that um, I found the, the things that Kira was saying really interesting because ideologically speaking, I'd be very similar, I'd be very pro-social, pro-self-actualization of my students um, because I'm a counsellor and, and a teacher. I suppose, um, you know, the human element of education is really important to me and the humanistic kind of side of things. But um, year three of teaching ethical education this year, um, I was in a bit of a situation where even though my classes are quite free-flowing and I have a lot of, lot of discussions going on, um, I did have a student that was actively sabotaging my classes with extremely controversial right-wing kind of really hurtful, harmful kind of comments. And even though we have a no shame, no blame policy in our school, we use restorative practice. Uh, he had spoken, been spoken to privately. Um, parents have been contacted. He was still actively sabotaging, actively uh, coming out with these really kind of right-wing views and not obeying the rules of the classroom, which is about sharing and openness and whatever. So. I struggled with it in the sense that I don't like censorship. I don't. I like you know conversations to be free flowing, but it came to a point where consequences and you know punishment and effect had to be applied, and he lost his speaking rights in my class. And um, so that was the first time that it, that had ever happened to me in, in 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 all the years that I've been teaching. But it was a necessary. Um, it, it just came to that point. Like, you know, that we, we had to have that consequence there. Now, the relationship between us as a result is not good. But knowing the nature of teenagers, and, you know, it's been a long summer now, I'm going to revisit that again when I go back in September. And I'm going to go back with the restorative practice and say, let's, let's talk about what happened last year. Let's, you know, have a chat about that and go back to our core values as a school and, you know, our the, the morals that we've talked about. And also speaking about the harm that was caused, you know, with the other students because it was particularly focused on the Muslim religion and we had a number of Muslim students in the classroom. So, um, as I say, I ideologically speaking, I'd be very, very, very close to what Kira's saying, but in, practical, in practical terms, it kind of changed for me this year. So I just wanted to say that. That's really interesting. So, yeah, that's a really tough question. There's a brilliant paper by a philosopher of education called Eamon Callan called When to Shut Students Up. And it's, it's exactly this question of how do we decide? You know, of course, as good pedagogical people, we want to encourage discussion and where people have misunderstandings or offensive views. It's usually, it's off, I won't say usually, it's often better to let them air those views, to have discussion about them, to help them see what's wrong with them. But sometimes it's not better to do that. And so this, this is a paper trying to navigate the path between how we decide one kind of case or another. His principal dividing line is, look, we have to do our best to figure out what the intention of the disruptive student is. If it is simply to disrupt and to cause offence, then probably shutting them up is what we have to do. If it's a genuine, you know, I, I'm, I'm really struggling to understand why people subscribe to the tenets of Islam because I just can't understand how that religion works. Well, then probably, if we can safely in our classroom, we ought to let them explore there. Um, but yeah, it, if we can figure out why the student is doing what they're doing, and that's not always easy, but if it's, if it's genuine questioning and inquiry, then we want to encourage it. If it's just cruelty, we probably want to shut them up. Sorry, I have to stand up. Um, yeah, just on what Kira was saying as well, I, much as I'd love to think that people can um, like or care about people who are far away from them, I just don't think it's biologically uh, possible. 
and I think that we are still very much tribes, tribal people, and we were we came from tribes that you know live with thirty people, and I think like everything, w we have a, a, an ingrained genetic approach to socialization. And e I, I lived in uh, France for a little while, and I remember being struck by if you banged into somebody, the first face that you got from the person was kind of a look of, um, I I'm not, it's not France. I think that Irish people go uh, through socialization to apologies and it's a front, but it, I think we all mistrust people we don't know. And that f French just openness to react that in a way that was natural was a distrust in their face. And if you said sorry, then they'd, they'd say, that's fine, it's grand. But there's an instinctive mistrust of people we don't know. Yeah. And we can't overcome that, yeah. I don't think. We can logically think about it and go, this is terrible, this awful thing has happened, but we don't have the same, I don't think, feelings that we do for people we trust and know. And much as we'd like to, I'm not sure we'll ever get there um, without rules. Yeah, yeah, great. Well, I, I think I probably agree with that. Um, but, I mean, we we could be wrong. We needn't be committed to that for all time. May maybe we can imagine an evolutionary future that is different, but I just, yeah, we're clearly not there yet. Okay, we have a little time, so I have a little exercise. Um, I want you to go with me for a minute. So if we go before before we look at that, if we go with these three categories, what we'll need to do if we want to teach morality rationally is distinguish between the robustly justified moral standards, the open question moral standards, the controversial moral standards, and the definitely unjustified moral standards. Right now, lots of people who have. Um, quarrels with me about this general view of moral education have said, well, that's too difficult. It's too difficult assigning all of morality to those three categories. It's too controversial in itself which category the different moral standards are going to belong to. So I just would like you to have a go in, uh, on your tables for five minutes at how we might classify these three moral standards for the purposes of teaching, for the purposes of rational moral education. Should we be either in actively encouraging allegiance to teaching us, us simply open questions or actively discouraging allegiance to each of these three moral standards. Do not smack your children. Do not engage in homosexual acts. And do not give offence. So just have a little go for five minutes on your tables at how you would classify each of those three moral standards.
Okay, sorry. Sorry, sorry. I, I did not mean to give you that long. It's Laura's fault. She engaged me in conversation. Okay, it would be great then in the last few minutes to just get some thoughts and feedback on those three questions, whether you think they are um, placeable in those categories or not, and why. Anybody prepared to offer something on any one or all of them? I think I might just pick on the table. Okay, all right, do that. <laughs> okay, I'm going down to this one. Everyone's avoiding eye contact. <laughs> Benjamin, would you mind? Um, for the first one, do not smack your children. We had a really interesting discussion here uh, on the table um, where we were saying that uh, it's, it's kind of a justified statement mm -hmm. because uh, would you smack your children deliberately as a punishment or is there another punishment uh, that that's uh, uh, if, for example, your, your children, whether your parents are in the classroom, they they don't uh, behave uh, according to a moral moral standards. Is th the punishment uh, a slap or something else? And that's where we were saying it's justified the statement. But uh, some parents here around the table were like, "Well, sometimes it does happen." So <laughs> what I did is that justified. On in the the discussion, uh, yeah, some parents here might disagree with the fact that I'm saying that. This statement is uh, justified. Is that correct? The, the way I phrased it. Mm. Yeah. No. Yeah, you see on the table <laughs> we're disagreeing. Yeah. Yeah. That is controversial because of uh, different depending on your culture. Um, some cultures would feel that it was justified. Um, so we had an, a, um, a person at the table who had um, an experience of being in Greece and a teacher admitted to, to slapping a child and admitted it to the parents. And the parents came in, they said, oh, that's fine, we slap our child at home. That's, that was their, so it depends on the culture, but it is on, we feel st strongly that it is um, justified to not smack your child. <laughs> <laughs> but in the right. classroom or at home, so it is. Fantastic, okay, so I'll, I'll let you into a like secret about this thing. example. <laughs> this is an example I use in the book um, and when I wrote the book, I used it as a, a straightforward and immediately um, acceptable example of a, of a controversial moral standard, thinking, oh, everyone will see that, recognize that that's controversial. And more than anything else, I've got into trouble for that, because so many people think it's just obviously true that that's a morally justified standard, that nobody should be smacking their children, which really surprised me. I didn't, I didn't think that would be the case. I'm still doubtful that, about the robustness of the justification for that standard, what we would need to be, what we'd need to be claiming, what we'd need to be claiming about that standard is is not merely that in an ideally best scenario, parents, all parents wouldn't smack their children. What we'd need to be claiming is that smacking children is so obviously wrong that people ought to be punished or censured in some way for doing it. And that I think is a, quite a strong claim to make, given that a huge percentage of parents do still smack their children and typically they don't get censured or um, judged or criticized by society. So if, if we think that really is a justified moral standard, then um, we're, we're actively promoting a standard that isn't, I think, universe, certainly not universally accepted, but that isn't even widely enforced in society at the moment. In some countries, yes, here, right, not in the UK, but in, in Ireland, yeah, 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 good, good, yeah, 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 oh, absolutely, of course, Defin definitely debating, not preaching, any persuasion is very subtle persuasion, but yes, but you... I do want to insist, though, that we do distinguish between uh, legal requirements and moral requirements. There may well be requirements of law that we do not think are moral requirements, and vice versa, moral requirements that are not currently legal requirements. So I don't want to equate those two, but it's an important point. It's an important point. Okay, I can have another table. Yeah, or, or, yes, or you on the same point, yes. Just, just on that, I mean, I know we've said smacking children is not okay, and I'm totally on board with that, but I often wonder what if we replace that with in terms of discipline? Mm -hmm. Because I feel that some of the current au fait methods of disciplining children are much more punitive. Right. And 
much more emotionally damaging yeah. than a smack that's immediate and over. And I'm, I'm not arguing for smacking. I'm just thinking that, you know, it is something that happens in a moment and we can move on as yeah. opposed to... No, it's, it's a great question. I was at a conference recently on punishment in schools and a historian was speaking. And he, the point at which it became unacceptable to physic to use uh, corporal punishment in schools in the US, uh, which was sort of the early, 19th, uh, the early 20th century, what it was replaced with almost immediately were forms of shame and humiliation <laughs> that were so degrading <laughs> that many people felt it was actually a retrograde step, that, uh, that a slap on the hand with a ruler was much preferable to what it, the, the dunce's cap in the corner or the b being, being put in a cage and sort of hoisted up for everybody to ridicule. They, what, what replaced corporal punishment was, was horrendous. So anyway, it's a fair point, yes. So it just it strikes me that we've moved away from the question of what type of standard it is towards is it right or wrong? And uh, if I m understood what you wanted us to do, it was more about is it justified? And if we're asking is it justified, shouldn't we be asking what is the justification? Is that not the discussion? Is that not where we should Good, be? Good, thank you. Thank you for bringing us back on task. Um, <laughs> yes, the... Because um, that's what we struggled with was, well, what is the justification? We all knew it was wrong, but Good. what's the justification? Good, good, good. Yeah, so what, I, what, I'm, what I'm wanting is... Are any of these standards justified and therefore should be uh, directively taught in schools, encouraged in schools, uh, controversial and therefore taught us open, or clearly wrong and therefore we should discourage allegiance to them? In relation to your question specifically about do not smack your children, I mean, I think you could argue that the, the, the prohibition on violence, I mean, I've said there is a, a basic prohibition on hurting one another, on, on harming one another. If you accept that, right? Yeah. If, if you accept the justified the general justified moral prohibition on hurting people, then you could argue that, well, smacking children seems to fall under that. Under standard, but you don't have to accept that. Sure, but I've just, just spent an hour justifying the other <laughs> one. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, fair point, yeah. Okay. Would you mind? No worries. I'm looking at you. Good, so this is exactly what Laura was taking me to task in when I, when I was uh, neglecting my responsibilities as a speaker just now. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely, and, y and what you might, uh, of course, it only, it's only even intelligible to have a prohibition on stealing if there's such a thing as property in your society. So yes, you might, you might say, look, if there's, if there's any such institution as property, then stealing things is wrong. If there's no such institution as property, then it isn't. And, uh, Well, even then, if, if, if there's no such thing as property, then I think the, the very concept of theft doesn't have application. It doesn't make sense, I don't think. But, um, however, what I was disputing was the claim that there really are societies with no notion of property. So even if you say, even if you belong to a, a, a society which treats all land as communal possession, um, pretty much all societies, at least your clothes are yours. There's going to be some things in any social group that are seen as, as rightly belonging to their owner and which there needs to be a prohibition on depriving their owner of. So I still think it's, it's actually a universal standard, but of course it is predicated on there being such a thing as property. Anyway, sorry, another table, yes. Um, yeah, sorry, oh. <laughs> we were just saying at this table that, um, that legality wasn't necessarily enough of a justification yeah. for any of them because yeah. we were saying that, you know, legally you shouldn't smack your child, but also legally homosexuality was illegal for such a long time that yeah, it's good. not enough of a marker for morality. I think that's really important. So I, yes, I think a, a really fundamental aim of, of moral and ethical education is to make sure everybody grasps the distinction between law and morality because they're not the same. Yeah. Um, just to go back on your point there about illegality and morality, but we're all educators here, so do we have not a moral obligation to teach the children about the legality of each proposal there? And I think that's an important thing. So even because our opinions are um, debated by how we feel, so that's our morality. And is it unfair on the children then to put that on who we're educating? Well, I mean, so, so what, I, what I've tried to argue and what I believe is that it's a serious mistake to put 
all of morality into the category of personal opinion. Yeah. That, that's the mistake. Of course we need to teach children what the law requires. That's really important. Yeah. So, you know, that's a fundamental educational responsibility. But it's also the case that not all of morality is personal opinion. There are some moral standards that we, any society needs to have in place and we all need to enforce, and there are very good reasons for enforcing it. And whether any individual personally likes that or not is simply irrelevant. So I, I want to say that the, the, the status, the justificatory status of moral standards is not a matter of personal opinion, at least in the case of clearly justified and clearly unjustified standards. There are controversial moral standards where oh, we, we have to fall back on our own best judgment because that's we, there, there aren't, there's no clear right or wrong about it. But I, I be, I'm really reluctant to say that anything moral, well, that's a personal opinion and therefore we mustn't um, impose our view. I don't think it does belong in the category of personal opinion. No, I'm just saying, because you're saying we don't live in a utopian society and we all have personal opinions towards people and not everything's perfect, so we have personal opinions, mm. no matter, subconsciously, so I just, I want to come back to that, and that's, I think that's yeah. really important when it comes to moral standards. Like I, I think even subconsciously, we think different things, even though we want to believe that we are that perfect person. Sure, okay, so so one thing, one thing that... It, comes immediately to mind here is the necessity of us of us as teachers having conversations about these things right we yeah you're right that lots of teachers think different things and so if we're to have any kind of coherence in our moral approach to moral education we're going to have to have a conversation about okay well which are the standards that we're all on board with that it's it's okay for schools to teach and which aren't Oi. we're really running out of time two more points the two people yes. yeah i just wanted to ask um just because we're we're dealing with we're talking about education and we're dealing with children what would be the level of intensity? You know, how far would you go with the, the moral discussions you're having with children? Because a lot of what we're talking about here, I would deem might be a bit too intense for children. As in, I know that, I think it's Piaget talks about children, their first experiences of morality is innate and it's true play. Um, when they're playing with each other, they, they develop their own rules and they're really, really into them. Um, they're really strict about following them, and that's their first uh, basis of morality. So I suppose it would be different for second-level teachers, but in primary school, should there be a, a kind of a cap on, you know, what we're going to discuss? You know, how intense the discussion should be um, on morality. Really, yeah. yeah. Great. So I have I have two answers. Firstly. Um, of course, we have to take into account the age and capacities of the children that we're teaching. And what you can do with a, with a reception class or a year one class is very different from what you can do with a year six or a year 12 class. So absolutely, take that into account. Think about their level of understanding, their ability to concentrate for more than five minutes or whatever it is you need to take into account. But secondly, I was primary school teacher as well. That's my uh, school background. And, and I had amazing debates with my kids about morality and religion and creation versus evolution and and I think it's really easy to underestimate primary schools children's capacity to think about and engage in these questions so I definitely wouldn't want to say everything I'm talking about is just for second level I don't think that's the case at all but of course yes you're not going to get into the details of Thomas Hobbes with uh, five-year-olds sorry I know you're running out of time but um, I think what's important to remember when you're teaching anything, uh, um, morality being one of the really important things is that no more than us here questioning your um, beliefs that the children are given the space to question whatever we teach, whether it's morality or whatever, that they have the ability to say, well, I don't actually agree with that. So we're not indoctrination, as you say, that whatever we teach, that they have the ability to question that and that they have the space to question whatever you think so that there's... Um, a debate going on and that the children can um, come to a, you know, a, d a decision in themselves and that we're not telling them what's right and what's wrong. Um, I think that's really important. So I think I mostly agree with that. I, I think my only reservation is, I mean, I think a good science teacher and a good history teacher does that in the sense that, look, you can give an account of this is, this is what some scientist says or this is what the textbook says, but, you know, are they justified? Can, can we reproduce the experiment that yields that result? Or can we go back to the historical sources that show why they think this? And, it, and in that sense, we pass it back to the children to make the judgment. So in general, I agree, wherever possible, we don't ask children to take things on our, on our, our authority, but we help them to see how we know what we know. 
I just don't think morality is that different. I think there, there are things we know in the moral sphere. I think we just know we, we can't have a situation where anybody can go around stealing things or where people can go around thumping each other. And we know why we can't have that. And we need to bring children to see why. Um, and I don't think that's fundamentally different from bringing them to see uh, a scientific principle. Say again? That, right, so we, we teach that by letting them discuss and take ownership of what they're learning. But, but that doesn't mean that we're not, that we don't have an end in view, that we're not trying to get them to a certain point. That's all, yeah. Last question, very Sorry, last question. I, I guess I, I just have, we had a really good discussion about do not give a, uh, offence. Yeah. Um, and I, I, yeah, I, I don't, I thought it was justified and other people were kind of more, it's, not, it's controversial. Mm -hmm. and, and that challenge for a teacher when you think something's justified, mm -hmm. how do you know if, mm. if something comes up unexpected and you haven't done your homework beforehand? Right. And I feel like that's something we should never intend to give offence. Um, how do you know? Yeah, good, great. So I, I suppose one thing to say is I don't think the situation for ethical educators is that different here from the, the situation of science educators or history educators or mathematics educators. Yeah, w ideally, we've all done our homeworks and we've thought about things in advance. Sometimes kids will ask us a question that just goes beyond our expertise, beyond what we've had a chance to think about or read about or discuss. So I don't know that the situation is fundamentally different in kind, but I do think in this area there is greater consensus in those other subjects on an awful lot of questions about, about where these kinds of issues would be placed. Uh, not these kinds of issues. There's greater consensus about where, how to categorise things in science and history and less consensus at the moment about the right way to categorise things in ethics. And I think that's because we all collectively, as an educational community, need to think more and talk more and have more um, better curriculum guidance. I think the curriculum guidance that Educate Together has got is brilliant. I'm not knocking the curriculum guidance, but, but I think um, there's more to be done in helping us to see why certain moral standards belong in certain categories and others don't. In the book, incidentally, one final plug, I do talk at, at great length about these two examples, in, including the do not give offence. And I conclude it's controversial that sometimes it's absolutely the right thing to do to give offence, but there we go. Okay. That's it. I'm going to stop. Excellent. <laughs>